Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereals shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of Northwest Audit Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on your huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Here's a breakfast treat you'll go for. It's delicious Quaker puffed wheat or rice. Talk about good. These giant ready-to-serve grains of wheat or rice are premium grains. They're shot from guns, puffed to perfection, exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Wheat or rice shot from guns is good for you, too. Makes a thrifty deluxe family breakfast with milk and fruit. Tomorrow's shore, try this breakfast treat. You'll go for the one and only Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Level Landing was a small community located on a navigable tributary of the Yukon River. It was soon after the ice had gone that a small but sturdy boat came into dock, and a round-faced, cheerful-looking man stepped ashore. As soon as he appeared, the nearest man cried out, Hey, fellas, it's Peter Muldoon! The word spread through the town like wildfire. Peter Muldoon is here! He's got the Level Landing! Nearly everyone in Level Landing rushed to the riverside to give the well-liked trader a rousing welcome. Constable LaRue pushed through the crowd to extend the town's official welcome. His wife, Jean, followed close behind. Hello, Muldoon. Ah, oh, it's great to see you back in Level Landing. Ah, uh, LaRue, I see by your badge you're still the constable. And uh, Mrs. LaRue, how are you, Jeannie? Oh, fine. <laughs> and as pretty as ever. I uh, suppose you've heard that I changed my plans this season. Instead of bringing furs from the north, I'm bringing supplies from the States. I heard something about it, Muldoon. Yes, sirree. Pots and pans, yard goods, notions, tinware, staples, hardware, minor supplies. <laughs> They've got all that's needed to stock a store. <laughs> Muldoon, I, I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry? Well, that's a fine thing to say, LaRue. You've all been in the grip of that money-grabbing, thieving, skinflint Ezra Caswell, haven't you? Well, we sure have. But, Muldoon, you don't understand. I looked the situation over when I was here the last time, Constable. And I've had reports that the situation hasn't changed. Caswell's Emporium is the only place inside of 50 miles where you folks can buy goods you need. Am I right or am I wrong? You tell me, Jeannie. You, you're right, Mr. Muldoon. You you're bet right. I'm right. Just because Caswell has a monopoly, he charges three times a fair price for everything he sells. Am I right? Yes. I'll sell you what you need at half what Caswell charges, and I'll still make money. Competition's what this place needs, and I'll provide that competition. Muldoon, let me tell you something. You're not the first man that's had that idea. I'm not? No. Three men tried to go into competition with Caswell. And things happened to each one of them. That's right. Constable, you sound grim. It was grim things that happened. The first one got lost in the woods. He died of exposure. The second one left town in the middle of the night. No one knew why. There was a fire that wiped out the third man. Killed him, too. You think Caswell was behind those things? What I think don't count. But the fact is, Caswell would have lost a lot of money if those other men had stayed in business. Oh, of course, I can't prove a thing against Caswell. Well, but that's I... why you're so downcast looking. You're afraid something will happen to me like it did to the others if I open up a store. All I can say, Muldoon, is this. I'll do my best to see that nothing happens to you. <laughs> well, don't you worry, Constable. Nothing's going to happen to me while Danny's on hand. Danny? <laughs> Look back there in the boat. Hey there, Danny, speak up! <laughs> a dog? Yes, sir, and he's as good a bodyguard as any man can have. Look! Look over there. Yeah, another dog. Yeah, that's King. Great day. What an animal that one is. That's King. And there's Sergeant Preston of the Mounties. Oh, sure enough. Hi there, Sergeant Preston. Hello, LaRue. Hiya, King. Hiya, boy. Hello, Jean. How are you? Hello, Sergeant Preston. Glad to see you again, Sergeant. Oh, and you too, King. Right. Aren't you Trader Muldoon? I sure am, Sergeant Preston. And I'm glad to meet up with you. Glad to know you. You couldn't have come at a better time, Sergeant Preston. 
Trader Muldoon has brought a whole boatload of trouble. <laughs> Nonsense. Trouble? A cargo of merchandise. I'm going to stock a store here at Level Landing. He plans to go into business in competition with Ezra Taswell. Good. But, Sergeant Preston, you don't know. I don't know what. Three men have tried to go into business here in Level Landing. And something's happened in every case. <laughs> LaRue is borrowing trouble, Sergeant. I was just saying that anyone wanting to make trouble for me would have to get up early in the morning to outwit my dog, Danny. How soon do you plan to open your store? Well, just as soon as I can get her ready. And going over to Jim Billings to see about renting some vacant property. Jeannie and I will go along with you, Muldoon. I know of a couple of places I can suggest. Good. I wish you'd come along, Sergeant Preston. Now that you're in town, maybe the things that happened to the others won't happen to Muldoon. All right, I'll go with you. Come on, King. I'll see you all later, boys. Can right, <laughs> your boat be all right there, Mr. Muldoon? <laughs> you bet it'll be all right. <laughs> Didn't I leave Danny on board? No critters will go coyoting around that boat while Big Dan's on guard. You have a lot of confidence in your dog. <laughs> I sure have. I trust Danny with all I got in the world. In fact, that's what I'm doing. I don't say Dan's the best dog there is, but he's a mighty good one, and he's as loyal as the day is long. Constable LaRue and his wife led the way toward the center of town, with Sergeant Preston and Muldoon following. The great dog king <laughs> trotted at his master's side, and then suddenly... What? Hold it. What's all the commotion back there? That's my dog on the deck of the boat. Look, someone's on top. He's getting away. King, that man. Get him, King. Look at him go. Great day. Uh, that mounty dog can travel. I'll go after him and see what that man was doing on your boat. Racing after the man who had fled from the ship, King did not know why Sergeant Preston had said, Get him, King. The great dog didn't want to hurt the fugitive until he found out whether he was a friend or an enemy. He sounded a warning as he cut down the distance. Get away. Get away. Get away from me. In a final leap, King dove ahead. His jaws closed on a boot heel. The man tripped and fell. The fugitive struck the ground and rolled. And then King was on him, bearing strong fangs. He issued throaty warnings to lie still until Sergeant Preston arrived. Call him Call off this dog. Call him off. Kill me. Take him away. All right, King. Let him up now. Good work, fella. That dog is vicious. Get up. Here. I'll do it. Dog like that ought to be shot. Dog like that. What are you doing on Muldoon's boat? Nothing. Nothing, I tell you. Just went aboard to look around. You tried very hard to get away when Muldoon saw you. Well, Sergeant, pull down that critter until we get Don't let me go. Let's go past. Muldoon seems to have found something at the deck of his oh, boat. Go. If you don't stop struggling, King might think you're fighting with me and take a hand, your hand. That critter meant trouble. Look what I found. He's going to blow up Muldoon's boat. What have you there, Muldoon? A can of blasted powder with a length of fuse all set to light. Oh. Who are you? What's your name? Got nothing to say. You took this powder aboard my boat. You'd have blown her up if the dog hadn't stopped you. Oh, you can't prove a thing. Caswell knew Muldoon was coming here with store goods. Did he send you to destroy that cargo? I'm not talking. It can't make me talk. Constable, do you know this man? Never saw him before. Must be a stranger in level landing. I'm well, just passing through town. Thought I'd look that boat over. Dog chased me off. Man, this... Watch it. <laughs> yeah, he came after me. I suppose you don't even know Ezra Caswell. If I say I never saw him, you can't prove different. Now, Constable, what are you and the money going to do about it? Why, you... Nothing. What? But Sergeant Preston. There's nothing we can do, Constable. But this blasting powder. I know he took it aboard my boat. No damage was done, Muldoon. You fella, you said you were just passing through town. Well, get started and keep going. That dog of yours tripped me. My claws are all dirty. I journey. said get going. All right. I'll keep going. It's a fine thing when a man gets knocked down almost two to pieces. A fine thing, that's all I gotta say. That ornery crook. I know he'd have blown my boat up if it hadn't been for Danny. We couldn't have made a case against him, Muldoon. We probably couldn't have proved anything. But I'll bet all I've got that Ezra Caswell has already made the first move to keep Muldoon from opening a store. You're probably right, Constable. We'll have to be doubly watchful so we can make a case against Caswell when he makes his second move. Aided by Constable LaRue, Trader Muldoon secured the use of a vacant building and moved in the cargo from his vessel. As soon as he was ready to do business, the people of Level Landing flocked to his store. Meanwhile, Ezra Caswell had not been idle. At his request, two men called Deke and Varney met in the office of the Caswell Emporium. Varney, I've been going over my ledger. You owe me a lot of money. I know I do, Mr. Caswell, but I've been having hard luck. I, I... don't like to hear about hard luck, so don't waste your breath. And, uh, you, Deke, 
You any idea how much you owe me? Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Caswell. Uh, I, um... <laughs> well, I've asked you two to come here for two reasons. First, because I have a job for you, which is right in your line. And second, because you can't afford to turn this job down. Uh, what kind of a job? I'll lay two to one. I can guess the job. <laughs> What's your guess? I've noticed crowds over at the Muldoon place. I don't see no such crowds around here. Go ahead, Deep. You're on the right track. You want Muldoon out of business. Is that it? Exactly. Now, hold on, Cassell. I know I owe you money. When you've done your job, I'll write it off. No, thanks. I don't want to get shot up by a dog like Muldoon's or Sergeant Preston's. I heard what happened to that man you hired to set off blasting powder on Muldoon's boat. Nothing happened to him. But Preston's dog caught him. He was just lucky that the bounty couldn't prove anything. I might not be so lucky. You get that same gent to do your dirty work. After he failed me, I sent him out of town. Caswell, it's dangerous to try anything while Preston and his dog are in town. <laughs> that dog of his has tracked down more men than you can count. Deke is right. I don't want no part of murdering Muldoon while we got Preston to reckon with. Turn me down and you'll have me to reckon with. Furthermore, I said nothing about murdering the trader. Well, you said you... I do... want you to get Muldoon out of business. You needn't kill him. Just set fire to his place. But, but when? That big dog of his is around there. Go there tonight after the store's closed. Well, Muldoon and his dog sleep in the back room of the store. You can shoot the dog. But I... You know the layout of the place Muldoon has rented. Now, there's a window in the back room where he and the dog sleep. Creep up to that window, shoot the dog, then start the fire. That old building will go up like tinder. The shot will attract plenty of attention. Besides, it'll waken Muldoon. What of it? be able to get out of the building, but he won't be able to put the fire out. The place will go up too fast. You got it all worked out, huh? I have. Well, you're forgetting just one thing. That Mountie and his dog King are in town. That's right. If what I've heard about that dog's true, he'll track us down in no time. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Preston's dog tracking you down. You do as I say, and you'll have nothing to worry about. How's that? Yeah, uh, you make a beeline from Muldoon place to the waterfront a quarter of a mile below the landing. I'll leave new clothes and shoes right near the big rock. Change to them, make a bundle of your old clothes, weight it with a rock, and throw it as far out into the river as possible. But the dog will have our sand even if we do change clothes. The dog's nose will be filled with the scent of pine tar. That'll kill everything else. Boys, I have everything worked out to the last detail. You do as I say and don't worry. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, tell me quick now, what do you think of right off when you hear these three famous words? Shot from guns. Why, right away you think of delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. That's because these famous ready-to-serve breakfast cereals actually are shot from guns. They're exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. To make them crisp and tender as nuts in November. Yes, they're puffed to perfection. And talk about flavor... Just pour out a bowl full, add some milk or cream, and top with fruit, like, say, sliced bananas. Mmm, mmm, there's a real treat. More important, long hours at school and play call for a hearty breakfast. And Quaker puffed wheat and rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So how about it, huh? You'll be getting off to a flying start when you eat Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. To get the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns... Always buy the famous big Quaker red and blue package. It's never sold in bags or bulk. And now to continue our story. Sergeant Preston and his great dog King lived with Constable LaRue and his wife during their stay in Level Landing. King dozed before the fireplace, half listening to the conversation between his master and the local lawman. In the meantime, Deke and Varney, acting on instructions from Ezra Caswell, made their way through the darkness to the rear of Trader Muldoon's store. The ground was clear of snow, but a brisk wind gave promise of a storm to come. Hold it, Varney. From here on is where we got to be careful. You got that pine tar with a smear in our shoes? Right here. Help yourself. 
over this trouble just because that Mountie's in town. It's a smart idea, though. When Preston's dog comes to the end of the trail that smells of pine tar, he'll be through. <laughs> this stuff will kill any other scent. You suppose that dog's as smart as people say? I don't know, but there's no use taking chances. We ought to shoot King as well as Muldoon's dog. Oh, never make a mistake like that, Barney. Like what? It's just like suicide to kill a Mountie. No one ever gets away with it. That dog is as much a member of the mounted police as Sergeant Preston himself. Well, I guess I got enough of this stuff on my shoes. Yeah, me too. Now, uh, hang on to what's left, and we'll toss it in the window when we start the fire. You all set now? Yeah. The window over yonder looks into the room where Muldoon and the dog are sleeping. Let's get going. The two crept close to the building, Deke approaching a window of a small room in the rear of the store. The moonlight slanting into the room revealed Trader Muldoon on a bunk and a big dog sleeping on the floor nearby. The dog hasn't stirred. <laughs> Guess he's not as much of a watchdog as Muldoon figured. Barney had gone to the front of the building to start the fire. Deke waited at the window, gun in hand, ready to shoot at the first sign of action on the part of Muldoon's dog. I'll wait till the dog moves. Give Barney as much time as possible. Maybe the dog won't stir at all. Maybe we can start the fire and get away before the dog wakes up. The seconds dragged. Then Danny heard a stirring in the store beyond the bedroom door. He sounded a warning, then looked at his master on the bunk. He growled louder. Huh? Uh. What's the matter, Danny? What's the trouble, boy? Danny! Danny! Muldoon raced to the window from which the shots had come. He saw a man's form running through the darkness. Come back here! Come back, you murdering polecat! I'll get you for that! You just wait! As the traitor turned back to Danny, he found new cause for alarm. Fire! Red flames were licking at the front of the building. Flames that leaped high from a pile of oil-soaked waste and sped rapidly fanned by the stiff breeze. Fire! The store's on fire! Help! Help! His dog was Muldoon's first concern. Got to get you out of here, Danny! Got to get you out, boy. The flames spread quickly, and Muldoon's dog was heavy. Gathering the furry bundle in his arms, he staggered to the rear door. I'll get you out, boy. I'll save you. The smoke's getting bad. The dog was motionless in Muldoon's arms as the traitor fumbled with a latch. I'll get you out. As Muldoon made his way from the building, choking with smoke and burdened by his dog, he saw many townsmen approaching from all directions. Muldoon! Muldoon, what happened here? Well, it's as far as they fall. We can't save this building if we can keep the fire from spreading. Sergeant Preston grasped the situation away. quickly and organized the townsmen to protect the buildings near a small Dune store. That's it. Then, with King at his side, he hurried to where Constable Aru and Muldoon were talking next to Muldoon's dog, lying motionless on the ground. My, my dog. We heard shots. There were two shots, Muldoon. Do you know anything about them? Yes, yes, I do. Some ornery polecat shot through the window. Got my dog. Did you see the man? Just a glimpse of him as he ran toward the river. And he left the trail. My store is going up in flames. Can't do anything about that, Muldoon. The fire's got too much of a hold. Burn my store and shoot my dog. Oh, the dirty, scheming crooks. Sergeant Preston. Take a look at Danny. See how bad he hurt. Larue can do as much for your dog as I can. Take charge of him, Larue. Right. I want to put King on the sand as soon as possible. Now, you say he stood by the side window and ran from there toward the river? That's right. All right, King. Come on, fellow. We have a job. Hanging's too good for the critter to chop, Daddy. You made a mistake, Muldoon, in trying to get away with anything like that while Sergeant Preston and King are in town. King will run him down in no time. You just wait and see. Look, Larue. Danny hasn't stirred. Danny's hit hard. Do you think he's going to die? We can tell better when we get him to my place. Now, come on, Muldoon. The rest of the boys will take care of things around here. Sergeant Preston led his dog as close to the building as the flames would permit. The great dog picked up a scent near the window through which Muldoon's dog had been shot and followed the scent without difficulty to the edge of the river. Now what, King? Where do you go from here, boy? His nose close to the ground, King hurried downstream along the bank and then returned and went upstream. All the while, he whimpered in frustration. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston crouched the ground and drew matches from his waterproof box. The ground was frozen. Too hard to show tracks. The hard-packed ground revealed no sign of footprints. Preston examined the rocky shore. Then King came back and stood at his master's side. He tried to apologize for his failure. King, we're supposed to think the gunman got away by bolt, but he didn't, boy. The water's too shallow here, and the rocks are too big. He came to the water's edge, then turned and went somewhere else. King cocked his head to one side, trying to grasp the meaning of his master's words. Trail, King. Trail. He knew what that meant. 
He knew what was expected of him now, but he was baffled and bewildered. He tried to find the scent, but it was gone completely. How could he tell the Mountie that the strong scent of tar that had filled his nostrils had dulled his senses? What's the matter, boy? Can't you find the scent? All right, fella. Never mind. You've done your best. We'll go to LaRue's place and see how Muldoon and his dog are getting along. Come on, Jim. King followed his master dejectedly, head and tail low. He knew that he had failed in his assignment, but he felt ashamed. When he reached the constable's home, he went to a far corner of the room and flopped to the floor. He lay there quietly, watching Preston, the constable, and Trader Muldoon. King did his best, but he lost the trail completely. The man who shot Danny went to the river, and there the trail ended. Maybe he got away by boat. He couldn't have used a boat in water like that. I think he doubled back. I'm sure he's still in this vicinity. Muldoon thinks there were two men. Oh? Huh? He thinks he saw a second man join the one who was running from the house, just after the shots were fired. Oh, that's quite possible. I don't care so much about the store, but the skunk that shot my dog. How badly is Danny hurt? Mighty bad. He may pull through, but it, it's critical. Uh, the dirty polecats. Oh, if I could just prove Ezra Caswell was back at that shoot. Did you check on him, LaRue? Oh, yes. As usual, his alibi is perfect. Yes, it would be. Muldoon, I don't suppose you got a good look at the man who shot your dog? Uh, nope. I wish the critter had shot me instead of Danny. Poor Danny. I wonder why he didn't. I'll tell you why he didn't. He wasn't afraid I'd know him the next time I saw him. He was afraid of Danny. Just a minute. Huh? A sharp tone in Preston's voice brought King to attention. I have an idea. Yes, King, it involves you, boy. What's your idea, Sergeant? I'm going to take King and start downriver, following the shoreline. You think you can pick up the trail of that murder and crook? We'll try, Muldoon. And in the meantime, you and the constable are to circulate a story around town. A story? What kind of a story? Muldoon's dog was just brushed by that bullet. Just slightly wounded. I wish that were so. Your dog will know the man who shot him. Poor critter's hardly conscious. Never mind that, Muldoon. You see that everyone, including Caswell, is made to believe that your dog will be all right in a day or two. We'll see what happens. Whatever you say, Sergeant. I'll have a look at your dog and turn in for a couple of hours sleep. I want to start down river early in the morning. Several people saw the Maori and his dog start out the next morning and head along the shore downstream. Word spread that he was trailing the man or men who had set fire to Muldoon's store. Ezra Caswell heard the news and laughed as he sat in his office with Deke. <laughs> yeah, the fact that he's gone downstream proves that he's lost the trail completely. I sure hope so. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about, Deke. Pine tie you and Varney put on your shoes killed all other sense. We've outsmarted Preston and his dog. I sure hope that Mountie keeps going. Oh, don't worry about him. We... Hey, did you hear the news? About Preston? No, about Muldoon's dog. You didn't get him. What's that? I didn't. You told me you shot that animal. I was sure I hit him. I saw him fall. You brushed him. You just scratched him. That's all you did. The dog saw you at the window. Why, confound you, Dick. You spoiled everything. I sure did. Muldoon and his dog are staying with LaRue. As soon as the dog is out, you'll be in danger. We'll all be in danger. It'll be a dead giveaway if the dog goes for you, Deke. Deke, you got to finish your job. But, but I... You've got to go to LaRue's house tonight and put another bullet in that beast. And this time you must not fail. But the constable will be there. And his wife and Muldoon. Well, I'll invite Muldoon over here to my store and talk to him about a partnership or something. I'll have him bring LaRue along. That'll leave only Mrs. LaRue in the house. That'll help. Yeah. You won't have to worry about Sergeant Preston. He and his dog are a long way downstream and getting farther away all the time. That evening found Constable LaRue and Trader Muldoon in the Emporium as the guests of Ezra Caswell. Caswell was using his most well, genial manner. <laughs> and gentlemen, just to show you that the suspicions against me are unfounded, I'm going to post a substantial reward for the capture of the men who set fire to Muldoon's store and shot his dog. More than that, Muldoon, I'm considering a proposition for you. Something whereby you can come into this store with me. A Meanwhile, Jean LaRue was at home, sitting by the fire in one of the two rooms that made up the cozy house. She heard a sound and turned toward the door. The man who stood there, his face concealed by a large neckerchief, held a gun in readiness. Don't move. His voice was muffled by the cloth. A, a gun? Sit still and be quiet. Another man whose face was concealed came into the room. What? What do you want? The dog's in the next room. Don't go in there. Go get the mutt and be sure you get him. Right. You'll regret it if you open that door. Open it and shoot fast. Oh, 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 
That door! The great dog king had been poised and waiting. As soon as the door moved, he charged, throwing the door wide and knocking Deke off balance. Deke's gun was thrown up as the powerful dog leaped at the hand that held it. The shot was fired into the ceiling, and Sergeant Preston was right behind his dog, rushing it by. Oh, no, you don't! Oh, here's another! Oh! Eugene, take charge of his gun. All right, I'll get the other one. Get this dog off. Get him off. You kill me. Back. Get back, King. That's it, boy. Now get on your feet. Uh, that, that that's that dog. you come. Oh. Uh, see what's under that neckerchief. No. There. Uh, it's deep. Oh. Now let's see who this one is. He's just regaining consciousness from that goo you gave him. There. Know him, Jean? Why, yes. His name is Varney. You, Preston. You and your dog. You went down the river. I didn't stay there. Now, Deke. You and Barney are going to do some talking. And if you're slow about it, I'll let King persuade you. Though the Caswell store was closed for the night, Ezra's office door was still unlocked. And Ezra continued his role as a genial host. I hope you no longer think I had a hand in your misfortune. I... Something's going on outside. Well, Look who's here. Sergeant Preston. Uh, Deke! Barney! Listen, boss. Uh, we I'll do the talking, King. Guard those two. As well, you're through. What's that? We expected there'd be another attempt to kill Muldoon's dog. So King and I were waiting for it. We caught Deacon Barney in the act, and they've told all about you. Why, you sterling... Tell your boss, we had to do it. He'd have turned King on us if we hadn't talked. I arrest you, Caswell, in the name of the Queen. As well, you dirty... I assure you... Steady, Muldoon. Steady, man. I sympathize with you. The law will deal with you, Caswell, and he'll pay in full. You'll be back in business, and your dog will be with you, Muldoon. Now, come on, Caswell. You're going to jail with your friends. That's right, King. Thanks to you, boy, the case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of next Friday's program. Say, here's a tip. Quaker puff wheat or Quaker puff rice are never sold in bags or bulk. Not on your life. To get the famous crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the big Quaker red and blue package. You'll go for both delicious kinds. For variety, eat the wheat one time, rice the next. These tasty giant breakfast grains shot from guns are made from only the premium grains. So for the best, always insist on Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The Challenge of the Yukon, a feature of The Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, is created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Florday, and written by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. The Challenge of the Yukon is brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time by Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Listen next Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the adventure of... The Showdown. Having been driven by fear from one place after another, a young doctor finally had to make a decision that brought him face to face with the man who had sworn to kill him. King and I had to think and act swiftly. Be sure to listen to the gripping story of The Showdown on Friday at the same time. Don't miss this exciting story next Friday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. For a hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow, because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.